so let me say this. I hope you all didn't come to this workshop for a bunch of answers. <laughs> so if you want to leave now, <laughs> you can walk out now. I don't have a lot of answers to some of the issues that came up this morning, but I hope we can have some conversation about it. I am not currently a practicing clinician. I was trained as a clinical psychologist, but I moved directly into academia after um, my uh, internship and postdoc. So I've been on the research side of things for quite some time. I do want to move into intervention. I think I mentioned that this morning, and I thought by now I would be um, implementing interventions based on my research, but it's been very, very slow because I've been struggling with some of these issues that came up this morning. So what I hope is that we can talk a bit about what's, you know, what we may be able to do to best serve our young people. I'm just going to put the object, oh, no, 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 sorry, yes, put the objectives up. Um, and they seem quite ambitious. I wrote these, what, two months ago? Yeah. <laughs> but we're going to talk a bit about the need for contextually and culturally relevant interventions and then some of the limitations and um, hopefully we can together think about some tools that may be useful for doing this work. So who's in the room? Teachers? Raise your hand. Any teachers? School counselors? I know I have one over here. She has 700 students all by herself. One, two, three. School counselors, um, clinicians. Ooh, representing. OK. Any um, executive directors or administrators? You're not sure? It's OK. It's all right. He's like, think, maybe. <laughs> yeah, y'all help him get back home, OK? Um, so and what am I missing? What do we have? Let's see. Social workers, oh my gosh, my husband is a social worker. I could not forget social workers. Social workers, uh, I heard mental health something. Mental health coordinators, slash social workers, okay. Students, woo! Grad students, undergrads, all right. <laughs> Wonderful, okay. Is it anybody I missed? Anybody that I didn't get? Art therapists, school psychologists? Other faculty, other faculty and researchers? Is it just me? Oh, you have to be proud. If it's just the two of us, you got to be. Yeah, all right, there you go. <laughs> OK. All right, so just wanted to get an idea of who's in the room, but let you all see who's in the room as well. I do want to ask you to think for a minute, how does community violence directly or indirectly impact your work with youth? So think about that for a minute. And then I'm going to ask you, so OK, let me tell you how I do workshops. I do workshops, so you're going to work. All right. Um, so because you don't want to listen to me for three hours. Um, so now that you've thought about it for a second, find someone next to you and share with them how community violence impacts, directly or indirectly, the work that you do with young people. Find somebody. Everybody should be talking to somebody. If not, you have to talk to me. So let me ask you a question. How many people felt that community violence somehow impacted the work that they do with young people? And it's OK if you didn't feel that way. So I was saying how many people felt that community violence somehow impacts the work that they do with young people? So most people in the room felt that. Do you, do you feel that it's been different, or it affects it in a diff your work in a different way than other stressors? Or are there other stressors that are very similar? Which you described this morning as? Yes. OK. Yes. So we're yes. not talking about like school shootings or? Not necessarily, okay. no. The, that would fall under more mass okay. shootings. Um, OK. And, or family violence is something slightly different. Yeah, I think a lot about this day. And I feel like 
what the hard, and I don't know if this is similar for some other clinicians in the room, but I, I haven't experienced this. So, like, I feel like one difference in, in terms of, like, other stressors is oftentimes, like, I know what that feels like, mm -hmm. and I feel like I have been privileged to not know what community violence mm -hmm. feels like, and so I think mm -hmm. it's very hard because I'm not coming in with, like, a schema right. of, like, what they're going through, yes. and I want to understand, but I don't actually know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Somebody else has a question. That's a great point. It's just a comment related to what you were saying that when I started working with uh, more like low income, more like violent neighborhood communities, there was a lot of me like having to go through my own bias and asking people how it felt to experience these things. And I feel like lots of my preconceptions were wrong. Mm -hmm. So trying to really understand where these mothers were coming from on the way they were interacting with their kids. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to me as like, inadequate or maybe even like aggressive but there was an element of protection of how they were afraid that their uh, kids would go into interactions with the police or yeah. other community members so really also respecting I think for me it was a big learning to like respect what they were bringing to the table and incorporating that on the interventions I was doing with them mm -hmm. started to teach me a lot I still have a lot to learn because again I was privileged not to have experience community violence, but I think there was a lot of process of learning through like just asking these people how that actually felt and what it means to them because it means different things for different people. Absolutely. And this is a great point about you know, how many stressors do we have in common with the folks who we serve? And how many stressors do we not have in common with them? And what happens when we don't have a stressor in common? Uh -huh. Hi, I know you were talking about family violence being different, but for example, I work in an area with a population where they're exposed to domestic violence when they go visit a family member uh -huh. or a neighbor uh -huh. Uh -huh. or anywhere. Would that be considered community violence also? It depends on who's defining it. That's a great question. So you're not in your own home. You're visiting someone else, but you witness domestic violence in that home. It would depend on who's defining it. Some people would say that it's not. Some people would say that it is. Um, and, I, and I do want to be clear that when I said it was different, I didn't mean that the impact was necessarily different. All I was saying was that it's a different area of research. But it, and we also know, those of you that are familiar with polyvictimization research, you know that kids that are victimized in one setting are often victimized in multiple settings, right? So when I said it was different, I meant it was just a different area of study, not that it has a different impact on kids, or one is more important than the other one. Um, so in terms of thinking about stress and the impact that it has, we can think of things as being on a continuum. I like continuums a lot. Um, where we start with things you know, where it's op optimal functioning and we're at our best, um, where we're moving into reacting to stressors, we're moving into then being injured by stressors and then the kind of call ill or illness from stressors, where we're moving more into diagnoses. And so sometimes I think if you're a clinician, you may be seeing more um, folks that fall on this side of the continuum. And yes. Okay. So, um, so my husband studies moral injury. All right. But I know I'm gonna mess it up. <laughs> yeah. It's when <laughs> I can say anything. Okay. Uh, no, they're videotaping this. <laughs> um, so moral injury, when you engage in behaviors that are inconsistent with your beliefs and your values, we were going to get into that. We started talking this in, at lunch about something related to that. I was going to mention moral injury. Um, so he, they, he was working on a project that was studying mor moral injury in vets um, and folks who had served in the armed forces who may have been engaging in behaviors that didn't, you know, that weren't consistent with their morals and values. But there's a researcher, Patricia Kerrig, K-E-R-I-G, in Utah, and she she studies gang-involved youth and, and or youth involving gangs, and she has a life. There are gangs in Utah, um, and 
she studies moral injury. They don't. They have a different term for it, which I'm blanking on. But they study moral injury in kids who've been involved with gangs because you see the same thing. What we were talking about were kids who walk the walk and talk the talk, right? Or they get involved in gangs for safety. What we see in Chicago are kids. We see kids that are that get involved in gangs. We also see kids that are pretending to be involved in gangs, right? And that's where the moral injury comes in. So you have kids that are engaging in behaviors because the, the culture of the gang keeps them safe. Right? And so they may be engaging in things that, that go against their values and their morals. I had asked the question at lunch, has anybody seen the movie City of God? It's an older movie about Brazilian, okay. Um, that movie reminds me a lot of this issue. So if you haven't seen it, go see it. I'll try not to ruin it for you. But um, there was one, those of you that have seen it, you know, there was one particular character who could be described as more callous, unemotional, you know, who really got a thrill out of engaging in these behaviors. But everybody else just got caught up, right? Or they had to pick a side to keep themselves safe. And we see this a lot with young people. And that's where I believe the moral injury comes in. Um, Kind of thinking about differences between stress and traumatic stress, I touched on this a little bit this morning. Um, we've all experienced stress. These are external events that we think are, or we feel like are exceeding our capacity to cope. We may figure out a way to cope with them eventually, but in the moment, it feels like it exceeds our resources. And as we move in, into traumatic stress, we're thinking about a, something that's threatening our well-being. Our, we could be injured, we could be hurt, we could die. Um, or this, these things could happen to somebody else. So it's much more intense than just general stress. So this is, this, some of this may be familiar to you all. You've, you've talked about trauma before, right? And the three E's of trauma. There's an event that happens. Then there's a subjective experience of that event. So the person has to interpret it in some sort of way. And then there are the effects. And I like to use the lasting effects of the event. And all of that becomes part of this larger construct of, of trauma. And so when we're thinking about community violence, again, I'm kind of isolating community violence. Just, we defined it this morning, but just to make sure that folks, um, that we're all on the same page, we're talking about acts that happen in the community. They are interpersonal, but they're usually, um, they're usually conducted by a stranger. Um, or well, I shouldn't say a stranger, someone that's not intimately involved with the individual. Now, that in and of itself is kind of a tricky de definition because, you know, what do we mean by intimately involved? Um, a lot of times people know the perpetrator, even if they're not a close friend, but they, they're familiar with the person, right? Sometimes it's a complete stranger, but many times it's not. So it a lot of times def depends on who's defining it. Um, and you can be... You can experience uh, violence as a, as a victim of violence or um, through what, what we maybe call vicarious trauma. So you may have heard that phrase in, in your work. Um, and then you have the second experience, which for a traumatic stressor, of course, is the intense fear that people feel, the helplessness that comes along with that. And I have a lot of thoughts about helplessness. Um, the horror, and you have to interpret what's happening. And then the effects. We, in thinking about adolescents, they respond in different ways than younger children. Um, but we see intrusive fears or memories. They may engage in risky behavior after being exposed or repeatedly exposed. They may feel shame and guilt, particularly if they've been a victim. Right? So you all may have seen that. Um, you see this in a lot of revenge and retribution fantasies. Let me say uh, another colleague, um, Carl, Carly Durkinching from out in California, did some qualitative work with justice-involved youth. And she interviewed them about um, turning points in their life, for, for better or for worse, but just turning points in their life. And then she, she was interested in turning points that had to do with traumatic loss of someone close to them. And what she found um, is that for the younger kids, 12, 11, 13, 
experience, a tra it, when they said that a traumatic loss was a turning point for them, it usually turned them in the not so desirable direction. Right? They started thinking about revenge. The older um, kids, 18, 19, 20, when they experienced it and, and labeled it, I think that's mine, sorry, and labeled it as a turning point, um, they talked about moving in a more desirable direction. And she and I have talked a little bit about what, what's going on for the younger kids versus the older kids. So the older kids talked about losing someone and wanting to change their life for the better. Right? And, you know, I missed out on being with that person. And, and Whereas the younger kids were thinking more about, you know, getting back. Right? So just, and, and again, this, this was with a very small sample. I can't say that that would generalize, but I thought it was a very interesting finding. And I thought it had a lot of relevance for folks who work with young people right, and are assessing loss. And particularly if they're younger, it needs to be addressed as soon as possible. Right? Um, they may also experience a radical shift in the way they think about the world, their belief about safety. The world isn't safe. No one's going to protect me. Right? Some, sometimes some of that behavior starts moving into... Um, wanting to become involved with street organizations or organizations that may provide safety for them. So we get the presentation. There's a link. So the question is, you know, what interventions are out there? So this link will take you, National Child Traumatic Stress Network, to a whole list of interventions that are deemed trauma-informed interventions. And you have examples of those, fact sheets on those. So you can take a look at these. I, I originally thought that I would, we would dissect interventions. And then I thought, you know what? That's not going to be helpful. Because um, there are way too many interventions. And how do you pick one over another to, to dissect? Um, but I do want you to be able to access those if you want to. Um, anybody heard of this? Anybody used it? What are your thoughts about it? Yeah. Well, you know you got to explain that now. So here comes the microphone. <laughs> right here. I think TFCBT works really well for like. Um, a middle a child from a middle income family with like supportive mm. parents who had like one one specific trauma mm. um, and I think when it gets into more complex traumas or um, you like think about you know if you're trying to challenge this idea that my neighborhood is unsafe mm -hmm. but the neighborhood is actually unsafe it's problematic so. yeah that's a good point. Other thoughts about TFCBT? Um, well, I've never used it, but I'm being trained in it right now, mm -hmm. like doing the online thing. And I think a big part of it too is like exposure, which, yeah, like similar to that point, it's like, it, is that useful here? I don't know. Yeah. Do you hear the question? Is the exposure part of the useful? Yeah. Going home for Shield the patients, I think, is hard. Um, like, it, it's not us, you know, like some therapists think, like, oh, all of my sessions, my clients should leave feeling better than mm -hmm. they were when they came in the door. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, like, they're leaving and they're really sad and they're going to have a really hard night. And I think one thing I'm thinking about, like, with these youth who are, like, in dangerous environments, like, who are they going home to that's going to like comfort them that night after like a really hard TFCBT session? And that's really, I think really challenging is thinking about like, um, you know, oftentimes they talk about like with prolonged exposure therapy that like you don't want to do it if the trauma is still happening because yeah. So yeah. I think that's kind of like the major issue I see with this population. Yeah. 
Right. It's like putting out fires. Like every week you're putting out a fire. You, you come up with your treatment plan. You're ready for the next session. And then a new fire, you, know, right? you could have had a really great session the week before. Feel like you made some progress. We're going to build on that. And this is what we always say. We're going to build on that. Right? We're ready. You students, we've talked to our supervisors. We have our plan. We've rehearsed it in the mirror. We're good to go. And then a brand new emergency comes in with, with the client. Right? So you, can, you sometimes feel like you're not ever making any progress because of that. Um, I, well, let me, let, me, let me wait before I say that. CBITS? Have I heard CBITS? Do I use it? Not as many people as TFCBT. Thoughts about it? Anybody have any thoughts they want to share about it? In a lower income neighborhood, it's sort of a, oh, I'm so sorry, yeah. I tried it with a middle school population, mostly eighth grade females. And it was really hard for them, especially the re-exposure part. And they, they even had trouble with deep breathing exercises. Mm -hmm. Some of that was too anxiety provoking mm -hmm. for them. And with, I mean, even just to do the mindfulness kind of stuff was difficult. Yeah. And uh, one thing we settled on was uh, one of the uh, yoga bells. And we said, oh. follow the sound when you can't hear it anymore. And yeah. that was the only way we'd get quiet to do something like that. Right, yeah. But it, it was all too difficult and abstract for them. Absolutely. So we have these wonderful interventions. People put a great deal of work into developing them and testing them. I mean, even, you know, the TFCBT, CBITS, they've been evaluated over and over again and in some cases found to be effective. Um, but there's still problems with them. And I think some of the problems have to do with, um, you know, the cultural relevance of the interventions and the contextual relevance of the interventions. Why do we need these? Um, let me say first what we mean by cultural relevance. Just, I'm just kind of throwing out a definition um, that I found by a colleague. The extent to which interventions are consistent with the values, beliefs, and desired outcomes. Not of you, right? Not of your supervisor, but of the client within a particular community. Um, how much are we considering the, the community's norms or the group's norms, their cultural beliefs, their practices? Yeah, question? Oh, okay. Um, contextually relevant. Are there specific and unique characteristics of the environment that we need to consider? Um, particularly characteristics that serve to maintain the behavior. Right? You guys know about behavior maintenance. You've, you've done that work before. But now we're thinking larger, like what's happening in the community, in the environment, um, that might be maintaining the behavior. Okay, let me ask this question. Let me ask this question. Do you think Killmonger needs to go to therapy? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Y'all still mad at Killmonger, aren't you? <laughs> so take a minute. Find somebody different this time. And let's talk about why. Or if you think, does anybody think he would go? Anybody optimistic? Nope. You never know. You never know. Well, <laughs> let's talk about the point at, we, at which we met him. How about that? The point at which we were introduced. Would, would, he, um, would he have been talked into going to therapy at that point? Maybe. I got a little maybe corner right over here. Maybe. Uh oh, one second. All right. Let's take a minute. Discuss this with somebody. Why, why would he not go? Because I want to hear these answers. So discuss it with somebody first. Why would he not go to therapy? Because everybody says he's not going. Why would he not go? 
Now, if y'all if want to stick with maybe, you can stay with maybe. Why would he not go? Okay. I want to hear this. Why, and y'all y'all felt very strongly about this. Why would he not go to therapy? Why would he come see you? Uh-oh, wait a minute. His hand went up fast. <laughs> yes, it's on you. You can't raise your hand like this and then go, oh. Oh, no, I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, given the circumstances, he will, you know the fish in the water, the air in the bird theory? I don't know that theory. That says that, that it says that um, um, treatment, uh, sometimes, I'm just going to apply it to mental health. Yeah. Um, we often treat the fish as opposed to the water. So if fish were dying, we, instead of everybody was so, so busy trying to treat the fish, they never thought to treat the water that were actually killing the fish. Okay. And in their situation, what it was with him is um, treatment, treatment, was his father who was killed by his uncle. Mm -hmm. So that's how he viewed treatment. And so by him seeing that treatment actually killed his father, then he's not open to treatment anymore because now he sees treatment as the enemy. Mm. You understand? And that's why he probably wouldn't go to therapy. Not so much that he's not open to it, it's the fact that he saw that the treatment actually um, killed his father as, as opposed to changing the environment that had his father the way he was. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, now you want to? Yeah. Okay. Right. You got one right up here in the front. It's one coming to your left. Okay. So when 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 I first saw the picture and 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 you know you brought up the question. The first thing that came to my mind, I, I wasn't picturing him at that age. Because there was a point in the movie where they showed him where he saw his dad get killed. So when you say the first time you saw him, it could have been at that stage. But somehow the picture of him being an 8 or 10 year old, whatever he yeah. was, seeing his dad get killed, that's the moment you get him. Mm -hmm. you know? Now, let's, let's even go back. Did he see his father get killed? He knew something happened, didn't he? So now he wa he he's thinking probably now maybe you know that little voice on the inside he feels something is not right but he's still going to his, I'm a bit envisioning him going home thinking he's going to see his dad but he goes in and sees his no, dad. No, but there was a part of the movie where he was in the back. He was playing basketball. He was playing basketball. Mm -hmm. Okay. Downstairs. Okay. And then he went up. So he saw the shit. If anybody hasn't oh, seen this okay. movie, we are so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. It's just for some reason I have him there. But you're right. But even at that age, you know, it's, he knew something was happening. I think he, he obviously yeah. had a, uh, just by seeing it, he knew that his uncle was there. His uncle killed him. So at that point, there were so many things running through his mind. Yeah, at that how age, do you do, how you do you can, deal with that? Right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, at that age, I think he's a little bit more set into his mind. At that, I don't think there's no way. He, he would come there's at no all. way. There's no way. He's he was setting his mind on what he was going to do, accomplish on behalf of his father. So maybe when he was young. Maybe. So when you think about well, not so maybe he, I, I think so when he was young for sure. You still think so? So he walks in, he sees his father dead on the floor. Right. I don't know at what point some of you folks that are really into comic books may know at what point he realized who. He killed his father. I don't know if anybody knows comic books well enough to follow the stories that we're not told in the movie. But when he finds, I mean, can you imagine? What if he's like 13 when he finds out what really happened to his father? Right? Now you got another traumatic incident. Because now you got to make sense of your father's death within the context of your what? Your water or whatever. Yeah, okay. <laughs> right? You got to make sense of that. Right. Oh, I think there was one question over here and then we'll come back, okay? Yeah, so it was my understanding that he didn't know the specifics of it as a child, but the thing that he did see was that here is this, you know, powerful resourced African whatever community that left his community helpless mm. against the attacks of the oppressor. Right. Right? That so was he message. saw he grew up very much aware and experiencing, you know, the community implications, right? Yes. Of yes. being under resourced, being powerless yes. against this my you know, majority oppression. Yes. Right. So I think that's a piece of it. But yes. the reason why I think the adult killmonger would likely not seek treatment relates more to 
kind of the identity formation that occurred in that context. Okay, to say right? more so, about that. Say more about that. Thinking about, you know, the fact that the reason why he was so driven and tenacious and persistent in his goal and kind of had this strategic plan, multi-step process, right, was because of kind of the morality, right? He kind of had this moral motivation, yes. right? It was, yes. uh, he saw, you know, himself and his community as wronged, yes. right? And he saw yes. these people as the perpetrators of that wronging mm -hmm. and made it his life's work, his mission, his reason for living, mm -hmm. right? Which is why ultimately he chose to die right. rather than to coexist with them, right. right? His mm -hmm. reason for living, his, you know, entire existence, his identity was wrapped up in his vengeance, right? right? And right. So, to, so to identify, you know, a problem or to try to come up with goals of your, your intervention, right? That's not a problem for him. Right. They are the problem. Right. And his existence yep. is in reaction to the, the consequences right. of their behaviors. Right. So he doesn't see there's anything wrong with him. Exactly. Right? Because it is his identity. Exactly. Yes. Then we'll come back. Hello. Okay. Um, so I think like this movie was like last year or something like that, but or the year before Two years that? Ago. Two years ago. Okay. But there was a part in the movie where they fight for yes, the first they time, do. and he takes his shirt off, right? Yes, yes, and you he see did. all of the marks. <laughs> <laughs> but no, like, you, yeah, you know, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> Summer body, all right, all right. But um, no, but there was a part where he took his shirt off, and you saw like a million marks. Right. And for me, that. Um, it kind of came back to me, but it sounded like, okay, his father died. He was hell bent on, you know, finding justice, changing things, mm -hmm. but that was trauma. Yeah. Him preparing as a young child. And I think every mark represented somebody a battle or something that no, he killed. He killed. That's killed. constant trauma for many yes. years. And so if a person's want to go to therapy, I don't see how that would work because he's out there continuing to, you know, do what he's doing mm -hmm. to reach his mm -hmm. goal, mm -hmm. and now it's like normal to him. So I don't kind of yeah. see... So now you switch back. Yeah, I switch back. Okay. I switch. And even yeah. thinking about this identity, you know, we've taught, you, you guys have probably talked about visible identities and invisible identities. So even if we think about this, you know, this vengeance as being his identity, you, you might not know that by looking at it, but he made it part of his physical, visible identity, didn't he? The opposite. Yes, 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 yes. Um, and in some cases, they believe that the strategies will make things worse. They, um, and another study found that students who endorsed that fighting is sometimes necessary didn't differ from um, adolescents who had more general beliefs about aggression in terms of, of their outcomes. So, so even if kids said, sometimes this is necessary, they weren't doing worse than the kids who didn't believe that, or the kids who thought maybe we shouldn't fight at all, right? Um, so trying to sell an intervention in which you're saying, don't do this, when some kids believe it's necessary, you're working against engaging folks in. Now, I, again, I don't have the answer for what you do in that case, but just saying. Um, stereotypes. I would imagine that he has a lot of stereotypes about therapy. And these are some of these stereotypes, right? Because <laughs> they know people who go to therapy who they wouldn't consider crazy, or they go get help. They know black folks that get help. They know folks in their community who may not be rich that get help, right? Here's where they start saying, well, then, okay, well, then it's for weak people. So how do we change that perception to get folks in the door? Um, going to the first E, the event. One way we define trauma is that it, it's something that happens outside of the usual experience. Have you heard this before? Well, what's the usual experience in Chicago? I've been talking about this for a while. What's if you're defining it based on something outside of the usual experience? For some kids who are experiencing community violence, this is the usual experience. So now we have a problem with the definition of the first, and it's not, that definition is not contextually relevant.
in addition to it being defined as outside the usual experience, it's often defined as a past experience. If you look, this comes directly from a DSM. Was exposed. What about continuous exposure? These are just some measures that assess trauma. You may have used some of these in your work. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with them. But if you look at the questions about trauma, they're asking things that have happened in the past or something that has happened to you in the past. Even our community violence measures that we've used, and we've used a few of these in our work, they always ask about, did this ever happen to you or happened to you in the past? I want to um, point this out to you guys if you're interested. There is a model, not in the US, though. Um, although there have been some folks that have started thinking about this, continuous traumatic stress model. It was developed in South Africa to describe young people who had experienced ongoing trauma under apartheid and the violent aftermath of that. And it incorporates the political and sociological constraints that intersect with living amongst continuous trauma. It's a wonderful framework for even thinking about any sort of trauma that you're working with that's, that's continuous. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how it fits into the reaction. So not only does it talk about um, how we measure and assess, because it says that it recognizes not only do, have we dealt with trauma in the past, but we have to think about the possibility of experiencing again in the future. And then when you're working with clients, you're not just dealing with the past, you're dealing with the likelihood that, it's, that they're anticipating it happening again. I um, was giving the talk this morning to a group of um, young men who work in the community and, and when I started talking about continuous trauma, one of them said, you know, this reminds me, you can't treat the headache if you keep getting hit in the head. You know, and I said, that's absolutely right. So the, the last few slides we're thinking about kind of contextual relevance, right? Um, and, and whether the way we define trauma, the way we measure trauma is consistent or, or is contextually relevant. Um, so I I, when we finished a few minutes ago, I was talking about continuous trauma and how many of the young people with whom you work um, are dealing with repeated trauma, not only something that's happened to them, but, but as, what's your name? I'm sorry, we were talking, I mean, Lance. 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 So Lance mentioned, you know, you work with somebody and, you're, and you send them home and they're going right back into a situation where something could happen, um, even as you are um, sending them on their way. Um, and that was related to the first E, which was the event. The second E, experience, we talked about um, earlier, experiencing intense fear, the helplessness, um, or horror associated with, with violence, and how people interpret that. And just to talk a little bit about, you guys are familiar with fight or flight, right? And so, you know, direct uh, exposure to stress, any stress releases adrenaline, cortisol, and um, to help you get ready to either fight or flee. And when the threat is gone, everything returns to normal. So when there is a threat and adrenaline is released, your heart rate increases, your blood pressure increases, your frontal lobe shuts down. We don't want to be doing any thinking, right? Shuts it off so you can react, your digestion. Anything that's not necessary for immediate survival is shut down. And, and systems that can help you respond immediately to the threat are activated. Blood um, flow increases quickly to your limbs, arms and legs, so that you could run or fight if you need to. But then after that threat is gone, those hormone levels decrease to take you back to baseline. What I mentioned this morning is that, um, you see these X's here, right? This, this loop back to, to baseline gets disrupted when young people are continuously exposed to stress. 
I mentioned threat sensitization, right? So it can create, um, some people like to call it too much of a good thing, right? Um, and so what happens is your stress response is triggered more easily and more often, even in false alarm situations, right? Or even in situations that are benign. Um, your body doesn't return to baseline functioning as quickly as it did before you started experiencing stress on a um, continuous basis. Can you all see these faces? Pretty clear. First face on the left, is that fear or anger? Anger? Do you see fear up there? Right here? What about this? <laughs> Not sure? Do you see anger up there? First one, okay. What about fear? The last one? What about that second one? Okay. These are the two pictures from the middle. And in this study, you might be familiar with this study they did with, with young children who had been exposed to trauma to try to understand their perceptions of threat. And the, the two pictures in the middle are actually digi digi digitally manipulated, and they're a combination. So there are several pictures in the row if you look up this study. Um, and then when you get to the middle, it's actually a mix of the two on the outside. It's meant to look ambiguous, which is why you were trying to figure out what it was. It was purposely done. Um, but they found that kids who have been repeatedly exposed to violence perceive this as what? Anger. Anger. So when you, when you have a kid who is likely to perceive something ambiguous as being um, threatening. I mentioned this morning the example of walking down the hall. But let's, let's, that's a peer-to-peer -peer interaction. What about an authority figure? If an authority figure raises their voice, moves at them too quickly, they're going to perceive it as a threat. We know that um, repeated exposure, your prefrontal cortex, the thinking center, um, over time, you know, or, or in exposure becomes under underactivated over time. And this is a very simplistic way of presenting this. To know that the anterior cingulate cortex, which is kind of the emotion center of the brain, becomes underactivated. Your amygdala, which deals with fear, um, is overactivated. Your hippocampus. Um, is blocked so that memories aren't sent to long-term storage. When something happens to you, if you pay attention long enough for it to stay, to move to your short, so everything's in a sensory memory right away. If you attend to it, it might move into your short-term memory. And if you then process it a bit more, it might go into your long-term memory. Um, sometimes what happens with trauma impacting the brain is that the hippocampus doesn't move the information to the long-term memory for storage. When something is moved to your long-term memory, think about everything that's in your memory. Don't think about it. Let me just make You have a lot of stuff in your long-term memory. If you had to think about all everything that's in your long-term memory at the same time, your head would explode, right? There's a lot of stuff there. Right? Um, so there are certain things that have happened to us that we can forget about, right? We call up, call it up sometimes into our consciousness, but most of the time we're not, we're not attending to that. We're thinking about that. Um, because it's it's in our long-term storage. But if things are being blocked from going into our long-term storage, they have more of an immediate impact on us because we're, we're processing it much longer in our short-term memory. And so the hippocampus blocks, it gets blocked from sending memories to long-term storage where they can be out of our awareness. Um,
I want to say, so these slides I borrowed from a friend, uh, Sonia Denizulu, who does a lot of work on trauma in Chicago. And um, if you guys are familiar with Bradley Stolbach, she works with him. And um, what they talk about, she borrowed this from the study up top, is how your brain processes in a typical, uh, in typical conditions, right? You observe something. There's some sort of input that goes into your brain. You have to interpret that process, you evaluate your options, you plan out what you're going to do, and then you act. Now, it happens very quickly, but for the most part, this is how our brain functions under normal conditions. And I shouldn't say brain as much as I should say our cognitive processing happens under normal conditions. But this repeated exposure creates what they call an express route, where it closes the road to the processing, to the to evaluating options, to planning, and there's just from and I'm interpreting this as a threat, and I'm going to act. Right. I I love this example, which is why I wanted to borrow it because it's exactly what happens. We lose this part of the processing, and we go straight to acting, and it's acting based on the interpretation of something being a threat. So the reaction may not be something that's going to help. In, in all situations. So what I mentioned this morning is that, you know, we, for many contexts, we see this as a problem. But young people see a lot of the stuff I'm talking about as survival strategies. So how do we, how do we intervene? How do we intervene without disabling survival strategies? I know y'all came here hoping I would answer that question for you. I don't fully have an answer yet. Present mo Sorry, I'm thinking like present moment awareness strategies where mm -hmm. you're like, you bring yourself back to the present moment, mm -hmm. you know, to be like, okay, what's around me? Like, what do I see? Like, okay, I'm in the classroom. I'm not out in the community. It's not nighttime right. or, um, you know, something like that. I'm wondering. Right. So having them, so some sort of grounding. Right. We'll get her over here first, and then we'll get the mic to you. Similar to what uh, Dr. Shaw was saying, I would probably use some cognitive restructuring strategies, checking the evidence, checking the facts, things like that, to you know, inform the decision making in that moment. So let me play devil's advocate. What if the facts that you're checking support what they're thinking? What if it is, because a lot of times we try to get people to see something is not a threat, right? But what if it really is? I guess what I'm also struggling with is to what extent does intergenerational trauma, continuous trauma, impact our youth? And that the strategies that they may be employing are ones that they've seen modeled mm -hmm. in very adaptive, maybe maladaptive ways over multiple generations of the family members that they live with. Right. Yes. And what do you do with that? Right. Um, we are going to talk a bit about intergenerational trauma in a few minutes. I, I think it. We, we were talking. I actually had this conversation with a few people today about working with young people and then sending them home. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, can the are the parents or caregivers or family members or whoever. Are they prepared to, to support a kid who has been exposed to maybe some 
you know, some sort of um, therapy in which it, there was, been, you know, uh, exposure involved or um, where they were re reimagining the trauma, right, to then go home after that. Um, are they prepared to deal with some of the, you know, if the kid is using different strategies to, to, to interpret events, are they prepared to support them in that? Um, what we, I'll try to get into this in a little, a little bit later, but a lot of times parents are dealing with their own unresolved trauma. Mm -hmm. right. um, I, I had a client years ago, and, and I, you know, I, I still regret that we didn't really get what was happening. But the, the, the I'm trying to remember how old he was, probably about 9, 10, was having a lot of behavior problems at school. But the clinic was um, a clinic for um, kids mostly showing attention deficit ADHD. And so he had a diagnosis of ADHD. But that wasn't his problem. And I didn't realize it until much longer after, you know, that I, sh I should have realized it. Um, Mom, he had lost two brothers, two older brothers. They were in their late teens when he lost them to gun violence. Um, not too far from one another in terms of time. Um, and, you know, I can only imagine what he's dealing with in losing brothers, but also knowing that he's getting older. And is this going to happen to me too? And we finally kind of realized we were doing a lot around setting up structure in the home and routines and new disciplinary strategies and all that good stuff, right? Uh, and then we eventually kind of started thinking about trauma and did some work with him. But then I had, a, I had to set an individual session with mom one day. And I re mom started telling the story. She said, you know, I think him losing his brothers, is, it really impacted him. And then she started telling the story about how they both died. And I realized that this woman is traumatized. So she had, I think, three older kids um, and then um, became addicted to drugs, was spending time in and out of, out of rehab. Um, but she talked about, with great shame and guilt, how she was down the street from where her son had been shot. And she was walking out of the drug house. And she was high. And she saw the police, and she saw that she didn't know what was going on. And that was her son over there. Sorry. <laughs> So, we can do all this work with this young man, but if we never heard that story from mom, we're sending him home to a traumatized mom. She can't support him, right? So I think intergenerational trauma is important. And how did she deal with it? She got clean, so by the time she was coming to us, it was almost like, I felt like she had started over. She got clean. She had um, four other kids, um, and she held on to them so tightly, right? And even though she was bringing her son in for therapy, they all came with her. And she was in a job readiness program. She was really trying to get it together. But she was carrying trauma, and nobody had ever asked her about that. Right? So. It's like if we don't attend to this intergenerational issue, we're not going to be able to get very far. So I, I have a lot of thoughts about that. Sorry, guys. I have a lot of thoughts about that. Um, other people have any thoughts about intervening without disabling survival strategies? So, oh, I, oh. <laughs> okay. Back here. Oh, okay. Okay. Back here. Oh, right here. Okay. I, I, have, I see a hand up. Okay. All right. Sorry. I know I did have the mic and I'm just looking around like who's next. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I think, you know, going to what you were talking about this morning is recognizing that they are survival strategies and working toward interventions that use those as a strength versus trying to take them away from them and disarming them and really learning or teaching them how to use them in a, an appropriate context uh -huh. um, so that they, you know, can continue to thrive. Right. So rather than disabling them, seeing them as strengths. 
I'm not gonna call on anybody. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let the mic folks handle this because I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> okay, they said back here first. Hi. Hi. Um, my response is more so uh, a realization than uh, an answer to the question in a sense because um, it's so hard just to fathom trying to teach those things to children, yeah. but it's, we focus on the kids so much, just like with your example, you know, you didn't think about the mother and the trauma that she had been going through. And with adults, with, with regards to the survival strategies, it reminded me of my perception of people from up north. Because for the longest time, I always thought that people from New York were rude. <laughs> and, you know, the more I really thought about it, it's a survival strategy. The way that they kind of just have this mind your business kind of mentality. It's not that they're terrible people. It's not that they don't care. It's not that they're not compassionate. But they know that if they involve themselves too much in a particular situation, no matter how good their intentions could be, that could lead to someone harming them. Mm -hmm. And... And then it becomes even more challenging when it's normalized to the point where this is something that most, just about every New Yorker will tell you that's a thing and it's, it's a culture. So then how do you work on changing that culture when those survival strategies are an established norm? And it is passed on from generation to generation because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's self-preservation. So then what do you do with that? Right. It's like Elijah Anderson's Code of the Streets. Somebody familiar with that book? It's a little dated now, but it, it was in the 90s, Elijah Anderson. It's an ethnographic study of um, Philly, Philadelphia. And he found through a lot of his work that there's a code of the streets and there are norms for how you should act and survive. It's posturing, you heard the term posturing, right? Mm -hmm. um, he had a different name for it, but it was posturing, right? And, and presenting yourself as being really tough, right? But, but he talked about this, the norms, which he talked about as code of the streets. Right? I know there were some other, I'm letting the mic folks handle. Okay. So I have two comments. I think the first um, with regards to interventions, and I think like you said earlier, the first first mm -hmm. is to attempt to build that trust yeah. and to show that vulnerability. Mm -hmm. So for example, in my case, it would be explaining how I'm, I'm not from, the same background, I haven't experienced what you have experienced, mm -hmm. can you explain that to me? Mm -hmm. And um, and listening to the stories and and uh, building the, the rapport, but also the trust yeah. uh, before just trying to correct mm -hmm. uh, something right. or, or or going with a with an agenda in mind. Right, or an ex I call it the expert mentality. Exactly. Uh, yeah. and, going and then the, the second mentality. thought is with re with regards to, to the mothers and the, and the parents and their own trauma is have you done any research or uh, come across any research with mother's desensitization and how that translates to the children? And it makes me think when you mentioned about the older teenagers in the increase of the depression, how by that time they have experienced their own helplessness and, yes. and hopelessness. Yes. So they're kind of giving up to this uh, uh, mentality of I have to pretend that I'm strong. Mm -hmm. and, and they're giving in into their own um, hopelessness. We're going to put that in the revision in our discussion section. Thank you. The helplessness piece. And the hopelessness piece. Thank you. Oh, oh, we're over here. Okay, and then over here, please, because her. Okay, <laughs> I, you, we're gonna get. To, I promise. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess my comment is, uh, we all work together, and we primarily work with this population. We work with kids ages thirteen to seventeen, kids that are charged with weapon offenses. So our stories range from kids that have seen murders mm -hmm. in all actuality have murdered other mm -hmm. kids mm -hmm. but have been caught with just the possession of the weapon. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is how do we intervene without disabling their survival strategies? The majority of our kids all have survival strategies. And whenever we get tied in with we need to provide CBT and all that stuff, I think we lose the focus of what we're actually doing. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we take that away because it's effective. Do not get me wrong, and I know it's, it's in the evidence-based research and we understand it, but we focus more on understanding who they are. Yep. Um, we want to understand their context, their culture. It's inbred in us, in some of us. Um, some of the people that work in our, in our offices have been through these programs themselves mm -hmm. and are now providing these services as a mentorship component. So our main focus is establishing the relationship with these participants. And in establishing the relationship, it opens up the doors, and then you really get to understand what is going on with them. And in doing so, then we can then have these open discussions on what is, re what is causing you, what has caused you to come into our program to begin with. Right. And when you have that, the real work really starts happening. Mm -hmm. And we're fortunate enough that we have them for six months. So I can tell you that sometimes within three months, they're still closed. And sometimes it feels like we're just throwing darts to a dartboard in a dark room. But so if we had the answers, I wouldn't be here. I would probably be up there and, you know, just collecting no, you wouldn't a whole, be up here. A whole We'd be check. on the beach. A whole check. You got it. That's Somewhere. it. Somewhere. Neither so, of us would be standing here. So it's, it is <laughs> a, a never-ending discussion. Yes. But, but we've been fortunate enough to do, the re to do research in our program and we are extremely effective in what we're doing, but we cannot pinpoint exactly what is making that well, happen. Well, you know what, and, and again, I, sometimes I think you don't have to, but, but the research in me says you do. But I think, and I'm not gonna forget your answer, I think um, something you said about open, right? These interventions are so structured. Yep. And again, they've been found to be effective. It's one of, but I, when I was doing coping work, when I was the coping research, I used to say, you know, I grew up in Arkansas, deep south, 11,000 people in my hometown. The only time I heard gunshots was during deer hunting season. That's it. I'm serious. And it's all the time. The, you know, I, I didn't know anything else about gunshots. Um, so who am I to go walk into a community in Chicago and say to, to a group of kids, I know how to tell you how to deal with community, but let me teach you some coping strategies. Really? They were coping long before I got there. Right. Right, and so I think what's better to me than taking and teaching strategies is providing the space, right? right? I don't know how to, what that looks like in intervention form, or if it needs to be, but I've been thinking about that for a long time. How do you just create the space? Is that what you're doing? Like, kind of like more that, like, I don't even know if it's psychotherapy. You're mm -hmm. just, you just creating the yeah. space. <laughs> Yeah. Giving them that space, mm -hmm. that safe haven. It's a good question. So we have a six month six month component that operates two days out of the week. So we don't have them that long. It's four hours. That is it. But in our time, in the six months, it's and we don't even follow the sequence. But just to give you an idea of what we try to do. There's a lot of group processing. There's a lot of cognitive behavioral interventions. That is it. Mm -hmm. We can't say that we're just fully CBT. And there's a lot of experiential, that we've, experiential models that we also follow. We operate in a hospital setting. Mm -hmm. So our clients, once we get to know them, we take them to the Rider Trauma Center here in Miami, Florida. They get to see what is happening to them. A lot of our participants have already been in there. So they're familiarized with what's happening. So they get to see it from an outside perspective now of actually what is happening to them. And they get to hear it from professionals as well as ourselves. They go to the, met to the morgue. It's not a scare straight tactic, because we all know here that it does not operate. Right. But what we get to hear from them when we're walking away from those classes, you get to hear what they're actually discussing. And I mean, their survival strategies are evident. They're, they're closed off, some of them, they make jokes about it. Yeah. But the importance is that is we have established such a relationship with them that it's non-judgmental, and they're just talking to us from that perspective of, man, this is hard. Yep. The other aspect is we take them to the pediatric intensive care unit where they get to see kids that are real victims, kids that are not even a year old that need heart transplants, mm -hmm. and there you see the empathy, which I think to me is one of the main factors for success for mm -hmm. these kids. When you see that they're empathetic, they, there's so much to work with. 
And so what we try to do is, besides building the relationships, is we try to build that empathy even more so within them. And that's through, obviously, just the relationship building with us and just being genuine, genuine with them. Because uh, they can read through BS a mile away. They sure can. And so we yeah. do not abide by anything of, well, this is what I'm going to give you. I am not the expert, as you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. I am in your corner. I'm in the fight with you. And I am, I am the student. You teach me right. what's going on. Absolutely. So I love it. Um, the non-judgmental part that you mentioned. When we were doing focus groups, not doing research, focus groups, no, not treatment, not, just focus groups. Just look. I can't tell you how many kids said in that group, nobody ever asked me these questions before. And I can't talk to my mom because if I tell her, you know, how upset I am about seeing my boyfriend walk down the hall with somebody, she's going to be, why are you talking, why are you worried about that little boy anyway? You should be in your books. Right? So when something else happens to her, is she going to go to her mom? No. Because her mom hasn't created that space. And I'm a parent, it's hard because you, you do want them to, Stop thinking about that little boy and yeah. start thinking about this. It's hard, but it. A lot of kids don't have a space. They don't. They don't have. Nobody's ever given them a space just to be. Right. And I. I just. I don't know what. I mean, you have explained what that look. Because I've been trying. To, what does that look like as an intervention? And you all. Are, you, you're doing. It. Um. Okay. Please. Yes. Do, Do you. you okay. A long time. I know, should I? Thank you. So years ago, I worked at a school, and I was brought into the school because there was a really high level of disruptive behavior, which allegedly I knew how to treat. Um, <laughs> and we did a lot of things. Um, but there was one thing I did kind of pragmatically, because I just wasn't there all the time, and I knew I was leaving at the end of that school year. My con I didn't have a contract beyond mm -hmm. that. Um, and so towards the end of the year, trying to think, like, how is any of this going to stick? Mm. I wish I would thought of this a lot earlier. But I started asking the kids, like, who, who, who's, who's your person in this school? Mm. And they would say, Mr. So-and-so is my person or Miss So-and-so is my person. And then I'd go to that person and say, this kid said that like you're yeah. you're their person, and they want to know if they can start to be like your advisee, or if I had set up like a daily report card or you know whatever the intervent like they want you to be the person that they check in with. And mm. I was just really floored how many times the teachers would be like me, mm. like I'm I'm their person, and you could see like the spark that happened, mm. and. It didn't, ha it didn't happen like across the board, but there were many instances where like suddenly that kid came under their wing. Um, and I think of like all the things I did in the school, I bet that's the only one that stuck, if huh. it stuck. And but when I did. look back at it, like I didn't do it to like build a relationship. Like that, to be fair, that like was not my goal. My mm -hmm. goal was like, my advisor is probably going to ask me if any of the work I did mattered and how could I prove it and how yeah. can I measure it. Yeah. So I was like thinking, you know, how can I show them I like build in sustainability. Um, but when I think back about that experience, like I don't actually think a lot of the technique mattered, but I do think the relationship, the relationship mattered. mattered. Yes. And that sticks with me because when we think about operating within a system, there are probably small things like that we can do that actually matter within the context of creating a safe and trusting mm -hmm. environment for kids to walk in in a school. And that could happen in an after-school setting. And I don't think that's the total answer, but I, I think there's something there that's a piece about of an answer. I, mean, yeah. I was talking to somebody earlier, and it's like, you know, you're not feeling like... Um, you're getting anywhere with your clients. We, and we talked about this an hour or so ago, right? But if, if they keep coming back to see you every week, they're not coming back for your strategies. I'm sorry. I know you think they are, and that's fine. But they're not coming every week because they're like, wow, I wonder what she's going to teach me next. I wonder what he's going to teach me. Maybe a little bit. They're coming back because they, they've connected with you. Right? Uh, one of, oh, she was sorry. next, sorry. And then you, sorry. Just really quickly, I think one important piece is piece of being open and being patient because with so many 
people that I worked with, part of it was like in the beginning they didn't trust or they were hopeless, mm -hmm. right? So hopeless. getting through this initial piece that makes us feel hopeless as well because we are, most of the time, I had no clue how to help these people because the problem was structural, right? It right. was going outside of what I could teach or do with any skills I could teach them in the therapy room. A few things that I thought were helpful, one was definitely the relationship and the non-judgmental piece of it. Mm -hmm. I think another thing that not with uh, youth but with mothers was very helpful was to give them a brief explanation of um, trauma and stress and what chronic stress does to your body like and your brain, kind of mm -hmm. the psychoeducation piece because lots of things felt more, like lots of them mentioned how they felt validated and how they felt, oh, so these things I'm experiencing make, make sense, mm -hmm. right? And it was not to say that they were wrong, it was just like, like physiologically that's what's happening. And so they were more likely to buy into doing relaxation and mm -hmm. other things like that. So providing bits and pieces of what we know is happening to them and yeah. kind of normalizing without taking whatever strategies they, they are using to survive out there. Right. And when we go to the medical doctor, they, t they explain to us why, most of them, why this is happening in this way for us. We can do the same thing. Right? Yeah, I, I just wanted um, to add quickly, when, when I read your, your question, one of the first things that comes to my mind is why do we have to disable the survival strategy? I, the thing yeah. is, you know, I, can't, I work also for the Juvenile Weapon Offender Program, and I kind of go back to, you guys talked about relationships. That's definitely a part of it as well, because... We're fortunate to have peer mentors, but we also have, we ourselves are mentors to these mm -hmm. clients, you know, and the relationship building is tremendous. I was listening to your story and, and I was moved because there was a story of um, back in the year 2001, this program has been around since 1999. Mm. And in 2001, there was a young man, 13 years old, up uh, 10 years old, and he lost both of his brothers on a month apart. And his dad went on depression, drinking alcohol every day, mother had two jobs, and I guess that's her mm -hmm. way of coping. And he came to this program at the age of 14 years old. And throughout the six months, he found a way to be able to, you know, he was able to see the survival strategies from a different perspective. Mm. And I say that to say this, and I feel personal about the story, because that kid was me. Mm. I came to this program, I was in this program in the year 2001, arrested for weapons charges. My brothers had passed away. But it's like, how was I able to go to this program? And I had a 10 year, a 10 year younger brother as well. Mm. And I remember going through the court system uh, as I was going to see the judge and, and thinking to myself, what my brothers did to me, the negative impact, mm -hmm. because that's what they were doing in my life, because they were in gangs, shootings, or so many things. I said to myself, I'm doing to my brother. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know how to change. When I, I remember coming to the program, just feeling close to the director, the coordinator that, that was there at that time, and the mentors that were surrounding me. I think that we talk about different strategies, but we forget to mention the mentorship part of it. Yesterday we had a graduation and one of the kids said to, to me, you know, I love you, Henry. He said, you made me, you, you, you've been in our shoes, you know what it is like. And then he said, to me, you're like a brother to me. Mm. Mm. The thing is, I always tell these kids, I can never be in your shoe. Because even if we walk down the same streets, we'll both see different things. Right. But to know that, brother, I understand what you're going through. Yeah. And it takes time. I go back, to, um, I've been meaning to go back, but I usually go once or twice a year to go see my sixth grade math teacher because she never gave up on me. And I never told her that until I actually started working here. I went back to her and I said, you know, Ms. Fernandez, I'm still alive. <laughs> and I'm working for the program. I'm the coordinator of the program. And it's just, you know, these are the kind of things, it's just the building of the, of the relationships, wow. for sure. That's Thank beautiful. you. Thank you. Let's see where we are. <laughs> um, uh, let's see where we want to go. What time we have left? I know, right? I know. Let's. We need to take a deep breath for a second. Um, uh, let's see. I know. I'm kind of running out of time. Let's see. The third effects, we talked about outcomes this morning. Um, ah. 
So these are things that young people have said to us um, who've been exposed to violence. The hopelessness is, is huge. Um, we talk a lot about trauma. We don't talk as much about the hopelessness in, in the research, per se. You all see it. But um, hopelessness and helplessness. One of my students has done a lot of work. On, I, I look at the outcomes of violence exposure. And she has looked at what seems to predict violence exposure, more of the individual factors. There are lots of factors, but she looks at the individual factors. And she's found that hopelessness is a huge predictor of whether or not kids get engaged, or I'm sorry, whether or not they're exposed to violence later down the road. And it goes through delinquent behavior. So they feel hopeless. They're more likely to engage in delinquent behavior, which then puts them in harm's way later on down the road. And well, I'll say more about that later. We talked a little bit about this this morning. And, and, and I think we have to be cautious about diagnosis, right? Is it ADHD? Or is it PTSD? So disruptive behaviors, the ODD, or is it is this the result of trauma exposure? I think we have to be we have to pay close attention when we're diagnosing kids. We have to we have to screen for trauma. Um, we've talked a lot about contextual relevance. Let's talk about cultural relevance. All right. So I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. We're not at tables. Um, I don't think yeah, I don't think we're gonna be able to do it. I was gonna have you work as a table, but we have these long tables. So I'm gonna get you to, to kind of group up a little bit, and I want I want us to think. Um, we'll start 1600s and work our way up. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> what? Sorts of trauma have African Americans experienced in this country? So I like write them down, work together, write them down, we'll go over. You ready to go? Okay. So what do we come up with? We start with the 1600s. What do we come? What, what, what do we start with? S slavery. Destruction of all of that is part of slavery. And it's removing forward. What what else? Is a part of slavery? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. So what are some of these different forms? What else has happened? Slavery. Jim Crow. Jim Crow. Segregation. Really? Housing discrimination. Even the Great Migration. A lot of folks fled to the north thinking things were going to be different and had a whole new experience of trauma when they got there. White flight is one. Gentrification. What else? When black people started moving into neighborhoods and white people fled Left to the suburbs. White flight. Yep. So that's... So the in kind of creation of the suburbs, the people left. And, but they took all the jobs and resources with them. And so they left these communities of concentrated poverty, joblessness. Right? They took all the industry with them out to the suburbs. Now they're coming back in. And taking, right? So in Chicago, they built all the high rises, moved all the black folks into the high rises. And now, when the white people decided to come back in, they tore down all the high rises and pushed them out. Dehumanization. Yes, talk more about that. Mm -hmm. even, even starting with the slave trade. Yes. Um, you know, African Americans, we were seen as animals. Mm -hmm. And then moving on, just as, you know, an object to yes. handle, there were even zoos. Yes. That People used to just watch the minstrel shows, mm -hmm. and then 
even further down in the media with the Central Park Five being called super predators. Yes, super predators. So even now, mm -hmm. still mm -hmm. going so on. Dehumanization, absolutely. So we, we came up through what, Jim Crow? What else? War on drugs, yes. Yes, now we Mass incarceration, so your 80s war on drugs led to mass incarceration, 90s, what, what, I see hands back here in the back. Oh yeah, so I had a, a list. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you want to stand up? Like, no, Lord. Do I want to stand up? Yeah, go ahead and stand up. Right. Read your list properly. You, you can't miss me, I'm pink hair. Um, I have slavery, uh, Willie Lynch, and colorism, and how that's affected us as far as how we communicate with one another. Um, and how we end up being our own worst enemy, and we don't really have to depend on anybody else to be against us. Uh, Jim Crow, segregation, gun laws, because the only reason uh, guns were regulated was because of the Black Panther, Panther movement, yes. and we were, yes. they were carrying guns, and so yep. they were uncomfortable mm -hmm. seeing black people carry guns, so now all of a sudden nobody else can do it. Right. Desegregation, because at the time, at least with segregation, there was a sense of community, you know, there, there you had Black Wall Street, you had all kinds of things where black people were investing their money in their own businesses. And there was a sense of self-reliance. When desegregation happened, now we're busy putting our money into other communities mm -hmm. and our communities are suffering in the, in the process. Um, of course, the war on drugs and the effect that it had on the family structure, because before when segregation was going on, 97% of black households were two-parent households. And then now, it's, uh, that's definitely not the number anymore. Mm -hmm. Where we've become a matriarchal system because of these, uh, these regulations that are intended to, or at least they're framed to help us out, even with regards to government assistance, because even with regards to Section 8 housing, one of the requirements is that mm -hmm. the father is not allowed to be in the household. And so you're kind of legalizing a family structure that's completely not, what's the, what's the, what's the name? The nuclear family. Mm -hmm. You're basically making it legal for that to not be a norm for the black community, but then at the same time using it against us, saying that black people don't know how to stick together. And it's just, it just becomes this conflict where we don't really know how to view ourselves because we're getting one message and a completely different message all at the same time. Um, then I have redlining because mm -hmm. the reason that suburbs got created was because they wanted to move all the white people away from the black people. Mm -hmm. And then what ends up happening in the long run, which is something that I never really processed, was how there's a disproportionate rate of black people who don't know how to swim and they always make the jokes about how we don't like to get into the pool, but only the suburbs had the pools. Ghettos don't have pools, so how can we know how to swim? <laughs> Stop. Okay. <laughs> and then I have uh, gerrymandering, which is basically how they manipulate yes. the districts in order to make sure that certain communities don't have certain advantages or um, conveniences with regards to voting, which increases the likelihood that those people in those communities are going to be able to vote. And um, the 13th Amendment, the school to prison pipeline, it's a lot. Thank you. You got them all. That's all the ones I had on my list. Thank you. Oh my God, don't, I, I'm traumatized. I can't, no, I'm serious. It's awful. You all have no idea how yes, awful this is. Yes, I'm sorry. He's talking about the, the educational structure and who has access to the best schools. Yeah. And he, he lived in Chicago, so we, it's, I'm sure it's not so good here either, but it is, having two kids in public schools, it is the worst. Now, I'm working for this situation that we have to health. Mm. Um, the mistrust of black people and the level, any type of health, whatever, it is, will be the perceived Yes, yes. And be, Henrietta Lacks, we can do all, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I was going to say some of what my sister said, but to add to that in regards to nuclear family, that was never the African-American template. It was always the extended family in regards to everyone raising or um, some, a child always come home to someone at home. Um, the other thing is moving forward for today, 
how slavery is being taken out of most history books. Mm -hmm. It's very hard so now to find nice. recent textbooks that have been updated mm -hmm. that have slavery, mm -hmm. cover the slave era. Mm -hmm. yep. When I think of trauma, I think of black on black crime. Mm -hmm. I think about, um, I have cousins in Washington DC too that went to, they were teenagers, went to a birthday party and um, one was like 16, 17, and they were, you know, caught in the crossfire mm. um, and shot by a 19 year old. Mm. And, you know, we don't want to talk about that where we see, where we dehumanize ourselves, where you have a young black male, female who shoot someone that looks like them. Mm -hmm. You know, I think about what does, what is that about? Um, like that lack of respect for the self mm -hmm. and lack of respect for, for others. So that, that pains me because that's something that a, a, a African American mother who's lost her son can't really talk about. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't blame it on another race. You can't, that's, that's the, that's the, the boy that went to school with him, mm -hmm. sat in class with him for years and shot and killed him. So that's, that's trauma. Mm -hmm. That's a trauma too. Mm -hmm. So let me ask a question. How, historically, how have African Americans dealt with trauma? How do we, I don't know. How do we deal with trauma? And you, in, a, in, family, in your family, these traumas that have happened, how have we responded to them? How have we dealt with them? Say more. Oh, wait, she has a mic. They've dealt with it by spirituality. spirituality. They've dealt with it in church. Mm -hmm. That's been one way. Um, they've also dealt with it in the family. There was a, you know, culture shifted and there were grandmothers. There was a grandmother at home cooking for you uh, who you could talk with that was somebody you could trust in. And that's not what this generation is getting. Grandma's a hot grandma now. She's, <laughs> she's 45 and she's a hot Don't girl. Don't have time. <laughs> and it's different, it's not. And, and you know, grandmothers now are working. Grandmas don't look the same no more. You know, you have jobs. People have jobs and work them. Somebody else had. A, oh, right over here. Wait, wait, wait. Right back in the back on the back row. I would say that the traumas are not being addressed, even though they go to church and they. They, they go to their spirituality, the things are never addressed because they're taught to sweep it under the rug, act like it didn't exist. It doesn't exist. We'll pray about it, whatever it is, but they never give it a name. They never give it a voice. They never give it a language because if I start to address it, then it really is an issue. And if that is an issue, I have to deal with it and I don't have the skills to deal with it. So I leave it as it is. So you're saying we don't even give it a name? No, they don't we give don't it a label name. It. Because we know that they have trauma. I know in our communities, we have uncles who have mental health concerns and that uncle has always been put in the back room. And you ask what's wrong with him and they say, he your uncle, leave him back there, don't say nothing to him. So it doesn't even have a name to it, they don't address it. Mm -hmm. And when they go to God, they go to God about whatever they're going to God about, but it never has a name. Mm. Mm. I'm sorry. As a black church goer, I'm going to uh -oh. respectfully disagree with you on that, and here's why. Without that spirituality, you can't turn slavery into a society. Wow. You, have, you have liberation with no reparation, and you think that thing came, you, you, had a, you created a society by osmosis? Mm. That was the plan. The civil rights move was a spiritual move. You understand? And a spiritual set, uh, um, strategy. Now, the fact that you came over here with no name shouldn't say you should stop you from doing the work just because you don't have a name. Mm -hmm. 
And it seems like we need people to validate us before we can validate the work that we do ourselves. And we're a victim of that because of this. We often let people, we need the validation of people so much that we'll disregard who we are. Even when, and I'm not against data, but the minute they put data out there, we just totally disregard it and dismiss the work that we've been doing. And we went in the cultural differences with that is because we wasn't raised that way. We wasn't taught to brag and talk about the work we do. We do the work, we get it done, we move forward, and that's how we become the way we are. So to say the fact that there's that, that something that don't work that you didn't study, had you study it, then you're gonna know the fact that it can work, you can prove the data that has worked, and that's why churches still exist. But you gotta understand, the only free entity you have was the black church. So to say that it don't work is, is totally disingenuous to me, right? I don't think, yeah, I, I think you are saying, you two are saying the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what, what, to to so what she's saying is not that churches don't work, mm -hmm. but that sometimes we take things, let go, let God, right? You know what we say, right? Yeah. Let go, let God. Sometimes we, we, we do that um, in hopes that the situation will, was, will change or be resolved, but we haven't dealt with the impact that it's had on us. That's what, and, and so you all were not saying different things. Okay. We're back to that last slide, which is how do we not uh, threaten survival mechanisms? <laughs> well, yeah, okay, I didn't think about that, but it, so, so, but, but it's how. You I mean, know, can it, I can I add something to that? Where where are you? I'm where right are here. you? Right here. Right. It's like I hear this voice. <laughs> yeah. It's like is because, that God? Is he telling you? <laughs> right. I am here, my child. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think she's here, let me right, say that, right? Right, That's right. Right, because I, I think there is kind of a tension that exists around kind of the function of the black church. Yes. And, it, and it is not something that is black and white. You know, there are kind of things, ways that it's been complicit and ways that it's been empowering, and both of those things exist. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the tension that she was trying to kind of get at a little bit is the way that spirituality has been used in some ways in the black community to promote a culture of silence. Yeah. So it's something that you say, you know, you go to God about it, that's between you and God, and y'all talk about it, but none of us ever talk no. about it. Actually, it's against the rules for you to open your mouth to anybody outside of this house about right. it, and inside of this house, you better not talk about it because right. now I'm about to whoop you and we're going to go to church and talk about it. So right. We need to go to pray about it as well. That's it. Right. So I think the culture of silence is one that is extremely insidious and that has many different implications because it teaches you that that, that kind of the idea that, you know, speaking is a, a sign of weakness or that, you know, sharing your story will somehow make you more vulnerable or, or you know, Open if, yourself up we, to threats or rejection. If we have to talk about it, rejection. we have to deal with it. Like what she said, right. if, we have to talk, if we have to label it and talk about it, we have to actually deal with it. Exactly. Right? Which is hard. So it's the silence and the avoidance. So then you're avoiding as well sometimes too. Yeah, so I think the real kind of way that we've dealt with trauma is by not dealing with it, by trying to push through, by trying to tough it out, by trying to suffer in silence and hope that one day, you know, by ignoring it, it'll go away. Right. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you were feeling it. It's okay. You were feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
a chip on your shoulder. Still do that same exact thing, mm -hmm. and, it's, and a lot of times it's based on money and the access to um to other services. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. They gave you the mic right at the end. <laughs> services, right? Right, <laughs> right here. Thank you. I guess I'm going a little off tangent now, and I want to, I guess, preface what I'm going to say that I don't have the African American experience. I have the Caribbean experience, the Jamaican. Jamaican. Right? Yeah, I remember meeting earlier. Yeah. So um, it's it's vastly different, um, but the way that we deal with trauma, and I guess it's not a traditional sense of dealing with trauma, which is what I think is coming up. It is again with religion, but it's also with things like music. It is with things like marijuana. It mm -hmm. is with things like talking to your friends and being outside and going to the beach and relaxing. And while those things are not traditional in that they are not counseling and therapy and CBT and blah, 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 that's our medicine, right? Mm -hmm. And that's how we deal with the trauma that we've been left with. And so it's really cultural. And I guess that's what it is that um, yeah. you were also pointing yes. at. Yeah. And even the music, right? Um, if you, if you read some of these lyrics, now, now I, can't, I don't know about the mumble rap. I, I'm I, 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 <laughs> I know I'm getting old now because I struggle with the mumble rap. But if you listen to some of these you know, lyrics, um, mm -hmm. Kendrick Lamar has a song. I cannot remember the name of the song. And, it's, and it's, it's, it's really telling the story of his life and growing up. And he talked about how when young men, his friends heard it, they brought him to tears because it was telling the story. Of what happens in this country. Yeah, I, I, I'm going from the perspective of even our clients um, or our neighborhoods, you know, and, and I agree with you. It could be it could be culture, it could be you know different countries, but I think if you're raised in a certain neighborhood, it becomes again. I'm speaking from our clients, even myself, growing up in in some of these neighborhoods, it becomes a norm. Mm -hmm. So you kind of put it under the rug. Mm -hmm. Um. My cousin got killed. Sometimes we, <laughs> my mom heard some shots outside, and um, they actually shot up the well, apartment, her apartment in the bottom. She went, she looked outside the window, she heard the shots, people screaming, a girl running through the hallway, blood all over the floor. Mm -hmm. And then we all talked about it the next day, and then after that, it's just, okay, it was just, just that's what they do here in Opalaka. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so, and then we talked to our clients, we have conversations about this kind of thing. So yeah, your cousin died, your brother died. Now, I'm, I'm sorry, bro, sorry to hear that. It becomes a norm. Mm -hmm. So unless these kids are a part of a program or there's some kind of services in school, which sometimes the plea is hard to anyone that works in the school system. But, you know, it's, um, they don't get these services. So I kind of go back to even myself. I think I'm, I'm 32, right? <laughs> I've never received any kind of counseling for my brother's death, ever. My dad has never done that, and he will never go to it because of the whole weakness thing or the culture thing or whatever the case is. I've never spoke. That conversation is not spoken at home. My little brother, not until the age of 17 years old, he found out that he had two brothers that passed away. And it's no, something I, I, I did that. Because I remember my mom, she put him in a school, and I told my mom, but don't even talk about it. you were socialized to do that. I'm sorry? You were socialized to do that. Don't put that all on you. Mm -hmm. You were socialized to do that. I yeah. just heard you say I did that to him. Well, yeah, because okay, you go were ahead. socialized to do that. <laughs> listen to yeah. listen to your mentor next to you. You right. were socialized to do that. Right. Going back, we don't talk about it. We won't talk about it. They told you not to talk about it, and you didn't. Yeah. They so, modeled it. When he was seventeen, I told him the story. He went back to his friends crying, like, "Dude, I had no clue that Henry been to jail." Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I, that's what that's what I wanted to say. Yeah. Sometimes we ignore it. It becomes a norm in our neighborhoods. Put it under the rug. Don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. And if you do, it's quick. You know, Kiki died. For real? Man, that sucks. Poor family. Okay, cool. And you move on. Right. I don't know where the microphones are going. Noni, something I'd like your perspective of is sort of like um, African Americans have a much lower risk of suicide. Um, and like I've always taken that as you know, there must be some resilience factors that are making that. And now I'm thinking, I'm wondering what you make of the fact that hopelessness is linked to delinquency. I'm wondering if like in white Americans, maybe hopelessness is linked to suicide. And in African Americans, it's like suicide's not acceptable, but like maybe in their communities, violence might be a more acceptable expression of like disregard for life. Passive death wish. Passive death wish. So... I heard you. 
I heard you. So a couple things about suicide. One, so I don't know if you guys have read that there's all this talk about the increase in rates of suicide amongst African American children. So, so it, it is increasing. Um, and I think it's important to talk about it. I, I think some news outlets took that took those numbers out of context a bit. Um, and they were also specific to a certain age group. But so I'm just saying all that to say that it seems to be increasing a bit. Um, I don't study suicide. I, I have some thoughts that are outside of quote unquote research. Um, I really heard of Homeboys Bakery in California, right? Um, Dr. Uh, Father Gregory Boyle and his work there in California. And he talks about the number of, now these are like emer emerging adults. We're not talking necessarily about young teenagers like my age group, but who um, were, are suicidal, but do not, would not ever go through the act of committing suicide. But they will walk into um, an opposing gang territory, knowing that they're going to get shot. Right? Police officer. So that's something people have talked about. Is we see the same thing with police officers. Not not the not the cases that we've been protesting. Right. But. Are there situations where people will purposely put themselves in harm's way because of the hopelessness and the, and the helplessness? Are, are, there, are there situations where people put themselves in harm's way because of the hopelessness that, that they are suicidal, but they would never go through the act of killing themselves? But they, put them, they may put themselves in a situation where, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. He's, he's not an expert. His name is uh, Father Gregory Boyle, B-O-Y-L-E. He started Homeboys Industries in California back in the 80s. Um, and he has a book called Tattoo on the Heart. Ta Tattoo on the Heart. Tattoos on the Heart. Um, tattoo, yeah. So I, I recommend it. It's just a lot of stories of his experiences there. But he talks about the number of young people he worked with who just would give up. And they would say they'd given up. And they, they'd look up and they'd walk into... Um, of the gang territory, and then, of course, be killed immediately. Um, you know, I don't know if spirituality plays a role. I can, say, you know, in my house, you, you know, you were taught that it was a sin if you harmed yourself. And, you know, it, I grew up in a very religious household. And so, you know, we were terrified of doing anything that might be considered self-harm, right? Um, it doesn't mean that Kids don't have suicidal thoughts. They don't have suicidal ideation. They do, but it's how do you respond to that, right? Um, and again, my student is she has a big interest in suicide and was looking at that that they might then engage in behaviors that put you know, in the police. Are, the question I always have is: Are how aware in those situations are they that that's what they're doing? Now, the ones who, that, that, that Dr. Father Boyle talks about, are, they know what they're doing, right? I don't know about younger kids if it's if it's a I'm tired I can't do this anymore or I just don't care. Yeah. Yeah. So the the, the, the hopelessness is it's, it's huge. It's huge. It's such a big factor. And you know he tells a story in his book about a a, a young. Girl, I think you, so you all have read the book and help me remember. I think she was like 16 or something, and she showed up to a party. She had this really pretty dress on, and everybody was talking about how nice she looked. And she told him, she said, Father Boyle, when I die, I want, I want to make sure they bury me in this dress, okay? And he's trying to envision her as an 80 year old woman <laughs> in this party dress, right? And then he, it's a foolish thought to him, you know, this image. But she's not talking about when she's 80. She was talking about, and she ended up losing her life a few years later. But the hopelessness um, is, is, is huge. It's pervasive. And I think that is, we, we found, so I'm kind of digressing now, 
I thought when I started doing work on community violence, that I would just kind of take all the work I was doing on multiple stressors on, in coping and just kind of move it over here. And we found that coping, at least in the way that we measure it, um, does nothing for violence exposure. Right? Um, but future orientation, so I'm going to give this to you all because you all work with young people. We have found future orientation to be so powerful as a protective factor. And all that is is being able to imagine a future for yourself. That's it. In Chicago, eighth grade graduation is huge. I don't know about Miami. Is it huge here too? OK. Eighth grade graduation, anybody from Chicago? Tuxes, limousines, the works. I'll get to prom in a minute. Tuxes, limousines, because there is a belief that there won't be a high school graduation. Prom is huge. So you all have prom send off down here? Prom send offs? I had never heard of this. And I thought the South overdid things. I had never heard of this until I moved to Chicago. They have prom send off. I wish I could pull up the picture on my phone to show you all. Prom send off, everybody comes over to the, um, usually the young woman's house, right? Um, and when I say everybody, I mean everybody and their grandmama and her cousin and the woman from the church, everybody is there, everybody. So it's really all the parents' friends is really what it is. There is food. The entire front of the house is decorated. The picture I wanted to show you was on our block because we, we just walk to the prom send-offs and when we see them on the block. There was a full throne on the front porch, fully decorated. And I, we, we actually were leaving, so we, I, I wanted to come back and see it. We weren't going to be home in time to see it. It was beautiful. My daughter's like, so I want my throne to be red. And I'm like, you, you think you're getting a throne on my front porch? <laughs> really? But uh, again, but, but it takes the place of a wedding. It's like a wedding. Right? And if anybody, I'll pull it up on my phone if anybody wants to see afterwards. I'll show you because I don't have it on the screen. But, um, and it's, people are, it's, it's a joyous occasion. It's beautiful. Like I say, if we see them on the block, we just walk down to them. And people are like, come on down. You know, it's a beautiful occasion. But it is, it's, and, it's, and, and, and again, not talking about the real issue. We say it's coming out of a place of collective socialization and communalism, and it is. It is, because our friends are there, our family is there. But it's also coming out of a place of fear, right? That this may, we may not be able to do this again. So what we found is that future orientation is so powerful and it's so easy. I just had a conversation last week at, um, at a meeting where somebody said to me, that seems like such a hard thing to do is future orientation. I was like, I, I think it's actually pretty easy because if a lot of kids haven't been asked, what do you want to do? Where do you see yourself in five years? You'd be shocked at kids. They, they, nobody's ever asked them that and they haven't had to think about it. And it seems bizarre because you all think about it all the time. Somebody think about it right now, right? I'm going to go back to school. I just met this woman next to me and she was talking. I think I'm going back to school, right? I'm going to do this. I didn't, you know what? So in your work, I, I encourage you to think about future orientation. And I was working with a group. They were doing arts and they were all what they called them um, teaching artists. Dance, music, poetry, spoken word. Anything, any sort of art you can think of, they were involved. And we were doing some work around um, the teaching artists because they were dealing with the kids bringing in trauma. And we talked about future orientation. I'm like, you all are teaching future orientation. When kids start in your program and they have a performance to do in six months, they're thinking about the future. And not only are they thinking about it, they're having to engage in behaviors to get ready to get there, right? That's simple future orientation. And, and it, it, this sounds so bizarre to us because we do it on a regular basis. But a lot of kids don't have the opportunity to think about what's going to happen. It's all in the moment. That's that threat sensitization, right? It's all in the moment. So I encourage you to, to think about future orientation. Uh, I know we got off. Um, it, it's a good thing. I'm not mad. I'm not mad about it. No, no, no. I just have to figure out where we, what, what to do. I'm, I'm good. I love this. This is good. But I, I just have to think about what to do. So 
How have we dealt with it? The reason I ask you all that question is, going back to, what's your name? Henry. Henry. Oh, Lord have mercy. You. <laughs> what's your name? Henry. Henry. Okay. You, all, you, you, all, you, you, took, you look at each other each time you talk, so I'm like, okay. It's the same person here? Okay. Henry. So going back to talking about how Henry was socialized, it was modeled for him, right? And I ask about how we've dealt with trauma over the years because we get socialized on how to deal with trauma. And sometimes we're working with young people without recognizing that this is what's been modeled for them. Um, this is what they've been told to do or not to do. And so we can't, in, in terms of cultural relevance, it's really hard to work in isolation. It's going back to the whole issue with the family and the parents. It's really hard to work in isolation because you may be having a, asking them about things that they've been told that they can't talk about. And so how do you then work with this kid in a way that's not going to get them in trouble with their family? How do you bring the family in? We're, we're talking a lot about these situations that it's a traumatic event, not for one family member, but from all family for all family members, and also the intergenerational trauma. This long list that everyone has, you know, sort of generated. And I wonder sometimes if the reason parents don't talk about um, the trauma or socialize other members of the family not to talk about the trauma is because of their own traumatic response. Mm -hmm. If it would be too overwhelming, yeah, that's some of it avoidance if it's their own numbing if it's their own um you know and that that is getting passed down mm -hmm. from generation to generation but maybe if there wasn't um so much pain in all of this all of the time that that belief that we think is cultural wouldn't shift mm -hmm. i mean i think that's I, I think that's kind of important and then because you're talking about the future and we're talking about numbing i, I have real problems with sometimes the shifts in the DSM criteria for PTSD because in my work with inner city kids and my work with gang involved kids etc I feel like the things that mattered the most got taken out so we've got the numbing is no longer a symptom right the sense of foreshortened future this idea of like I, what, what do I want to do in six yeah. months I don't expect to be around in six months mm -hmm. and in, and at the same time and I'm not saying that this is not that, that this addition isn't an appropriate addition in some circumstances, I, I believe it is, but we have now added to conduct disorder the limited pro-social emotions, right. callous, unemotional, callous unemotional traits. traits. And I really worry, I'm not saying they don't exist, I'm not saying they don't fit some people, but I'm really, really worried that those shifts together are gonna funnel more and more youth of color out of PTSD and into, and into conduct disorder absolutely. on a path to antisociality. We, we are concerned. And it isn't fair. No. We are, it's a great question. And one of my students is actually studying that. She's studying callous and emotional traits within this framework of desensitization yeah. to try to understand if what is being seen as callous and emotional traits is really a reaction to trauma. And if yes. we don't do some work on that, you're going to have kids absolutely that instead of being diagnosed with PTSD because they're, they're showing this numbing, they're going to be diagnosed with conduct disorder. Yeah. It's problematic. Yeah. They already are. In school, law, yeah. in school yeah. law, there's a very big, huge distinction between emotional disability and social maladjustment. And there's no empirical evidence for such a distinction. And some of the some of the kids who get put into that social maladjustment category where they don't get any services or any supports have some of these characters you're referring to too. So it's not just in the DSM, but it's also in education mm -hmm. too. In the, in the classifications in education. Um, where in the world are we here? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so you all, you have all these slides. Um, let me, let's do, we're not gonna do jigsaw because we don't have time, but that's okay. 
um, let me, let me, we, we need to come back down, I think. Um, so, why don't you take a minute. Think about what are your what are your intellectual gifts? What do you bring to this work? What do you do well? What gifts of the heart do you bring? And what's your walk? What's your journey? What's your purpose? Take a few minutes. Jot that down somewhere. Think about that. They both of y'all, all three of y'all. Come see me. Let's take a minute. What, what are your gifts? What do you bring to this work? What do you do well? What gifts of the heart do you bring? I wish I could take credit for this. This is an exercise my husband does when he does workshops that I think is um, very powerful for folks who have to do such uh, challenging work.
So I, I love research. Um, I didn't think I was going to be a researcher. When I decided to go to graduate school, I was going to be in private practice, same things. Far away from that um, as a career. But I, I really I just fell in love with the research process. At the same time, um, I get really tired of it sometimes. And I have a lot of conversations with other researchers. And, um, you know, sometimes, you know, this having to prove something that we already know is happening gets exhausting to me. And so I love having conversations with folks that are doing the, the real work, because what I'm doing is not the real work. And I appreciate all that you all do. And I know it's hard, and I think about I've been married 15 years. I love that man. But sometimes, anybody been married longer than 15 years? Ooh, OK, you all, <laughs> you know. You, <laughs> I know, I know, right? <laughs> so, you know, um, but I think about when I was trained to do couples therapy. Some of you that have been trained in couples therapy, you know, what is, what is one of the first questions that you ask a couple when you start working with them? Does anybody know? Why are you here? That's the first question. What, how did you meet? What did you meet? And you have them to, that's that, the first question you ask is why are you here? <laughs> the second question, so, and, and further down the, you know, the, in the session, you ask them or the second session, how did you meet? And you have them tell the story about how they met. You hear each person's perspective. And why do we do that? You can remember how it felt when you met that person. Yeah, and, and, and because sometimes if, if by the time you're in therapy, you, and not always, but sometimes you're done, right? It's reminding you of how you felt about this person because you don't feel that way now, right? Um, and our work can sometimes get like that, right? It can become so challenging that we forget what drew, it, drew us to it in the first place. And so I you know, encourage you to remember why you decided to do this work and how you fell in love with this work. And, Remember what your walk is and what, what you bring to the work. Because it's not easy. Oh, my God, it's not easy. Right? But I appreciate you and everything that you do. And can we end eight minutes early? Yeah. I'm that professor that lets people out early. Mm -hmm.